many doubted we'd ever see it, but here it is. The return to glory. McDavid stops up. What a move. Shoots. Scores! Welcome to the Outsiders as we continue to push our way through the month of December. It's Bryn Griffiths along with Robin Brownlee. How are you doing today? I'm good. I just heard McDavid shoot scores. That wasn't uh, Sunday against Buffalo, was it? <laughs> that was an awful hockey game. I, 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 I'm I, going to tell you right now, I don't care who wins at the end of the day. I, I, and, you know, the, some people cheer for the jerseys. I usually cheer for the people in the jerseys. You and I get an opportunity and have for many, many years to talk to players uh, one-on-one, and there's just some guys you like, and there's some guys that are okay. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't think I've run into a lot of guys where I went, I don't like that guy. Not not many. No. Nope. But for the most part, the, the classic example for me, and I remember it was the, the Los Angeles Kings were going for their first Stanley Cup. Now, we had a healthy dose of Matt Green here along with Jared Stoll. I'm trying to think if there's anybody else. And they were on the Los Angeles Kings, and they had a shot at this Stanley Cup. And I know a lot of people did not want to cheer for Los Angeles because, you know, they just didn't want L.A., La La Land, to have an opportunity to celebrate a Stanley Cup. And I'm thinking to myself, you know what? I I like Jared Stoll, always did. Great guy to talk with. Same with Matt Green. I, to me, it was easy to cheer for Los Angeles because I like to cheer for good guys. And I've always been that way. When we get down to the Stanley Cup final, I'll take a look at the team. And if I know some guys on that team that I've liked over the years, it's easy to pull for it's easy to pull for that team. But uh, I just uh, I, I I don't know. it's uh, that that game against the Buffalo Sabres the other night was just so awful. you couldn't pull for either team, even though there's some good guys on both sides. It was just horrible, horrible hockey. Yeah, it, was, it, was, it wasn't a great game, and it certainly wasn't a great uh, start by the Oilers who seemed to be set on playing like the Harlem Globetrotters for the first period of the game. Let's see how fancy we can be instead of getting pucks to the net. In the end, it didn't work out for them. So, yeah, bad hockey game. On the other front, I can count on all the years I covered the league, I can count the guys on one hand that I thought were real dicks. There weren't many. No. Now, you don't know everything about everybody, but just based on sitting, chatting, interviews, uh, hockey's pretty good when it comes to athletes as far as guys being decent guys. Good people. One other thing that's got to be pointed out about the Edmonton Oilers, who are still hovering around top spot in the Pacific Division, is the fact that other than the five-game winning streak they had to start the year, have they won three in a row? Nope. And they're having. And the thing is, they're... They're not, I guess the positive is, the silver lining is, they're not streaking in the negative either. And no. That's the thing. But it would be nice if they'd put together three or four to give themselves some breathing room. Arguably, and still at this point, they did give themselves that breathing room with the fast start 7-1 overall, including those five straight wins. They're right on the cut line if they play 500 points-wise the rest of the way, but... Give yourselves a little margin so it's not hair on fire down the stretch. Um, but, yeah, they have, at least they, they haven't spiraled, but they haven't strung together a bunch of wins since that start either. Taking a little bit of heat on social media because I'm, and I have been for the last couple of weeks, I'm at the point where it, it just seems to me Dave Tippett has been platooning his goaltenders. It's just he seems to want to go with his gut feeling on this particular game or that particular game. And as much as I, I've, like Mike Smith's start to the season, he just has tailed off for me. And Miko Koskinen has improved and has been more solid for me. And some people, for some reason in this town, people like to be able to pick goaltenders and then they'll they'll live and die with that one particular goaltender. I'm not like that at all. I If I think that one guy's got a better chance of winning games for you generally, you go with them. I think right now they should be running Miko Koskinen a ton to try to win more than two in a row. Are you seeing it the same way as me? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, in fact, I'm going to write that today at uh, Oilers Nation. Over the last, well, I just went back five games. But Miko Koskinen has maintained, for the most part, he had a rough outing a couple games ago, uh, how he started. I think he's at 921. Uh, Mike Smith's game has eroded. He hasn't been 
awful, but he hasn't been good enough. And Tippett's smart guy. Nothing you or I say or I write is going to be a revelation uh, to Dave. He'll look at it. He's not going to, well, I, I, it started off as a tandem. I'm going to stick with that no matter what. While it was working, you stick with it. He's smart enough to know that. Now, not so much. I think we are going to see more of Miko Koskinen until he plays himself out of that position as now the clear starter. I think Tippett will go with it. And here's the thing. Miko Koskinen was fine last year where he fell apart, was down the stretch in the second half when they just worked him into the ground. You still need Mike Smith, but you don't need Mike Smith as an equal partner. In other words, it's a tandem. If Miko Koskinen can play three out of every five games the rest of the way. Let that's, him roll. That's not an even split. Yeah, hey, and if his performance wanes, then maybe Smith gets some more. But based on what we've seen lately, go with Koskin in three out of five games with 50 games to play. Uh, that will still keep him just under 50 games, five less than last year. More important, there'll be rests built in there. Koskin, if you look at his game log last year, it was stupid in the, in the second half. Yeah. They just didn't have a choice. Now they do. So while the tandem may be kaput, as they say, for the time being, Koskinen still has, Mike Smith hasn't turned to garbage. He just has struggled. He struggled noticeably based on how he started. If he can give you a game here and a game there, it's still going to be fine. What you don't want to do is heap it all on Koskinen's shoulders because from the limited amount we've seen, which was only last year, he can't handle that kind of workload. So keep him under 50 games. It'll still be fine. The other thing, too, you take a look at the Oilers' start to this season. The power play's been on fire, mm -hmm. and I, I believe the, the, the power play can continue to be on fire because they've got some great talent there. I've always believed over the past 10 years that they've underachieved horribly as an organization because the power play has been ineffective. This year it hasn't been. The other thing, too, you've got McDavid and Dreisaitl who have just been on fire well, that's great. That's exactly what you want out of your number one and your number two guy or one or one A. The other thing, too, a lot of talk about secondary scoring, and I'm always a believer that secondary scoring should just just happen. Don't, don't start putting too much pressure on these guys to start scoring goals. Just let them go out, kill their minute, 45 seconds. Don't get scored on, and if you get a chance to put the puck in the net, great, do it. They have a second line that is a little uh, – You've got Ryan Nugent Hopkins, who's been out for a little bit. And uh, you've had James Neal on that line. Maybe the second line could contribute a little bit more. I just we we It's funny because we're going to chat with Brian Mudrick, who is the uh, television play-by-play -play voice of the Montreal Canadiens, who's in a market where they overanalyze everything. I guess that's a Canadian city thing, is it not? Well, it's a Canadian uh, city thing, Canadian with an A, and it's a Canadian thing, uh, Canadian <laughs> with an E. When it comes to Montreal, hey, expectations are high there. Uh, always have been, always will be. It ebbs and flows in Edmonton. Let's be honest. Um, you know, the mid-90s, nobody was expecting a Stanley Cup. Those were the Death Valley days for this franchise. The gory years, as I like to call them. Yes, uh, before, I mean, there, uh, there has been, of course, more recently the decade of darkness as it became known uh 12 or 13 years out of the playoffs but in montreal they don't care how bare the cupboard is uh you know how the draft has gone injuries they expect to win that's not a bad thing but it is a fishbowl and uh, whether you're playing there or working there it's noticeable calgary flames have picked it up are you surprised <laughs> you know i i wouldn't say surprised i the Calgary Flames, to me, when I look at them, should be better than they are. Um, I'm of Brent. I'm of the mind. It's pretty simple. I'm not cheering for either team. I like hockey in this province a lot more when the Oilers are good, the Flames are good, and they're uh, taking each, each other on in the playoffs. Yeah. We just haven't seen that in forever. I'm with you. I, I think it, it, every game is a big one. Every night is a big game. It doesn't matter which team is playing. I And I think that we're going to go down the stretch here a little bit where it's going to balance out and even out a little bit, and I think it'll be fun for January, February, and March. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that I believe the Flames are going to pick it up, 
And I believe the Oilers are going to level off a little bit. So let's uh, let's wait for it. One, uh, one, uh, well, there's two sports notes I quickly want to touch on, and that is the World uh, Drug Administration. You know, the guys that do all the drug testing around the planet have, uh, have basically handed down a four-year ban against Russia. Do you care? Now, this means they can't participate in the next couple of Olympics, and they cannot participate in the uh, World Cup of Soccer coming up. So, uh, you know, they, I'm sure they'll be able to participate under... The you know remember remember what happened last time where they were under the Olympic athletes what was it the uh, the Olympic athletes they couldn't they weren't there as be on behalf of Russia they were there yeah, that was bogus yeah seriously what kind of ban is that right those athletes <laughs> apparently proved that they were clean so they were still allowed to participate well you want to know you want to put some pressure on the the Russian government have the clean athletes turn around and say something to somebody about. I can't, I'm not allowed to participate because somebody is cheating. When are you guys going to do something about it? Maybe it's going to have to happen internally. This external pressure is just bullshit as far as I'm concerned. Well, you know what? I I won't say everybody, that's hyperbole, but there's a lot of cheating going on. My eyes glaze over now when it comes to uh, bans for this or that. And I don't know that I'm of the mind of, hey, let everybody cheat because I don't really care to have people sticking things in their body that are going to kill them uh, in their 40s. Uh, in the pursuit of excellence. You know, but keeping everybody clean until they find a real way to do it, I don't know that uh, that works either. So my eyes, honestly, Bryn, my eyes kind of glaze over when it comes to these things. Now, it's been going on for decades and I know. decades everybody find you come up with one set of protocols somebody finds a way around it um you know what do what you're gonna do i'll flip it on when the uh 100 meters starts when the this event starts or that event starts all the stuff behind uh it just becomes tiresome at least for me i was watching the nfl on sunday and a cfl game broke out it, it, i i i i've I can't remember when I saw as much scoring in the game between New Orleans and San Francisco. It was just so entertaining, a football game. But there's been some very entertaining NFL matchups, and we're going to go down the stretch here through to the playoffs and the Super Bowl, and I'm sure we're going to see more of the same. And one other quick note has just been announced. The Lou Marsh Trophy is awarded at this time of year, every year, and it goes to Canada's Athlete of the Year. This year's participant and winner is Bianca Andrescu. How can you argue with that? Now, there were some great athletes in the running for this, but she became the first Canadian to win a Grand Slam singles title in August when she beat Serena Williams at the U.S. Open. That was going to open up a lot of eyes. You knew that. That was a big event. Well, it was a big event, and just being a bit facetious, I think it was also worth uh, $9 million bucks or something There's like that. There's that, too, but, Which, you, you know... So you know, good on her, I guess. Right? right? It's 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 better to be rich and famous than just famous. Now, uh, in, in case people are wondering, well, who votes on this? And that we always go down this road. Uh, this is selected annually by a panel of sports journalists right across the country, and has been awarded since 1936. It's basically uh, it's a Toronto Star Award that's mm-hmm. selected annually, but they have had. Non-Toronto athletes win this, so uh, I, I can't say disagree too much with that. I think that what she did was amazing. A lot of people were watching that event in Canada that would never watch tennis, so uh, she accomplished an awful lot, and she did cash in. How many Crosbys in there over the years? Oh, there's a yeah, he's a multiple. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, coming up on the show today. In a couple of minutes, we're going to check in with uh, Terry Jones. We, we talked to him last week, but there was one little segment we didn't have a chance to get to. It's not a big segment, but we, we want Jonesy to plug the book that he's been working on. It's a curling book, and it's uh, I, I've, I've spent a little more time. Since we did the interview about a week and a half ago, I've spent a little more time looking at the book. It's, it's really well put together. Mm-hmm. It's a great book. We'll let him explain that. And also coming up in a couple moments, you're going to hear from Brian Mudrick, who's an Alberta native, who is the television play-by-play voice of the Montreal Canadiens. That is a sweet gig. Oh, you think? That is absolutely a fantastic gig. 
Uh, I've known Brian for a lot of years and uh, worked with him at CTV Edmonton along with Ryan Rashog. And we, the three of us, used to have so much fun in the sports department. And now to watch those two guys go on and do great things makes me very, very happy because they're both they're both young. I'm not. How many guys have funneled through here? Oh, uh, on you know, I I'm going back. I'm thinking uh, Darren Detition, uh, Ryan Rashog, although he's still here in Edmonton, but to be a part of that national platform. This has been a pretty good training ground for uh, some can, guys who've gone on to do some good things. We can go back even further. You have John Wells, who's one oh, of the originals, yeah. yep. who came through here. Gord Miller mm-hmm. came through here. Chris Cuthbert came through here. Oh, my God, the list is long. You talked about Dutchie. Another guy we should try to get on one of our podcasts soon, Dutchie. Uh, it, it's it's endless. Ernie Afghanis. Yep. The Golden Greek for years at <laughs> CBC Edmonton went on and did CBC Sports Weekend. That was the, one of the big shows. That was our initial version of ABC's Wide World of Sports. He had the good hair, too. Oh, my God, Ernie. Great, great guy. Wonderful man. But but the list is long, and it's a, an amazing list. But we'll talk to Brian Mudrick when we come back right here on The Outsiders. <laughs> When I think of Boyle, Alberta, I think of uh, a great time, a, uh, a place that's close to Long Lake, uh, a place that's got a wonderful golf course that has wonderful people, and a place that raised a guy named Brian Mudrick, who joins us on the show today. How you doing? You know what, Brent? Not even the most famous guy from Boyle, Alberta. Who is? Was, uh, Jay Onright. I was just going to say Jay is the other guy. <clears throat> I'm like this. I'm, I might be top four, actually. Uh, my mom's probably more famous than I am at this point as well, but uh, I'll take a top three or four billing at a boil. That's See, fine. I always thought Jay was from Athabasca. So Jay's mom, Joanne, and Dale, his father, they moved to Boyle and they opened up a pharmacy. And so they didn't know anybody in town. So our family, you know, welcomed them. And, you know, Ukrainian, Northern Alberta people just stuffed their faces with, you know, pierogies and cabbage rolls and the whole nine yards. <laughs> so became really good friends. Um, and then they moved to Athabasca, I think, when Jay was in about grade seven or eight. But the best story is that my dad had a Ukrainian rock band called the Rainbow Riders and <laughs> Joanne Onright was the lead singer. And you can't make that shit up like that is. <laughs> Now, what was was this was this Jay's first or second year in grade seven? Uh, uh, third, third. I, <laughs> hey, listen, Robin. I took five years in grade seven. It was a good time. You know, sometimes you got to hang on to those memories. Of, you know, grade eight or nine. And so. it's, it's funny you should say that. And, and see, I knew he was from the area because I had run into him at one of your golf tournaments. First time I'd ever met him, and of course he did the opening. Hey, I used to listen to you as a kid routine which i'm almost getting tired of hearing at this point but i'm also flattered but what a great guy that whole area is just a wonderful area of the province of alberta it you know what the people there i I did the golf tournament for 15 years you come home everyone comes together and takes care of one another and other than having to explain to people in toronto where that i'm from Boyle, that i don't need a medical procedure after i get through that and explain (laughs) where i'm from um you know people are cool with it and you know i'm always proud of Boyle. The other thing that people forget, when Fort McMurray had the, the wildfires and was devastated, Boyle was you know, on Highway 63, one of the towns that took in so many people. The local, of course, only in a small town, the curling rink and the hockey arena side by side had all like the storage of supplies, water, whatever you know, families would need. Boyle was a big hub to help people out. And I was, I was really proud of that. I remember I was getting makeup done at, in, in, in Agent Court in Toronto at our studios and uh, one of the CTV girls um, was overheard me talking to the makeup girl about how my mom got her volunteers for Santa's Anonymous, but they're now working for the fire. And so she actually, my mom got on CTV News because she wanted to hear the story, whatever. So I told you, my mom's a bigger celebrity. She's, she deserves more credit than I do. Hey, just before we get rolling here, because I just want to stay on this theme of the area you grew up in. Okay, cancer survivor, which I'm very proud to say uh, you you've beaten it back, but it has been hard on your family. 
but you have contributed. You said 15 years of your golf tournament in Boyle, you raised a ton of money for cancer research in the northern Alberta region. But I know that you would bring people in from Toronto for this event. And I used to, I've been, I think it was a two or three of them. I was always entertained by watching the reaction of people from central Canada coming to Boyle, Alberta for this event to see this and their, their jaws dropped open. It's, it was, you know, it is fun. It's hilarious to have. I've had people from the one year, my buddy Paul Boyd, who was with Inside Edition in New York. I worked for them in Winnipeg back in the day with Jay, by the way. We're all at that station. And he came up from New York the one year. I had a buddy from L.A. that came up, Toronto people. And and it's just it's just remarkable how it doesn't matter how small the town is or whatever. I joke, oh, yeah, I got you all at the uh, Four Seasons. Bonvoy Platinum Elite. You guys can use your upgrade credits at the Boyle Hotel. (laughs) But, like, you know, people come together. It's for the right cause. You have a great time. And I think everyone enjoys a little bit of small town, you know, redneck uh, hanging out uh, hospitality. And uh, we provided that. So it was good. I, I I miss the tournament. It's a lot of hard work, but we had a lot of fun years. Well, you know, Brian, you know, you've got a great gig right now, and we're going to get into that. And people make their marks in different ways in this town, if you're talking about the media landscape. And, and Edmonton's been uh, lucky enough or aligned enough to have a bunch of guys like yourself work here and then go on to a national platform. But I've got to say, just looking on from afar at things like your golf tournament, at other initiatives you've been a part of, when we're talking life uh, and cancer, uh, that's a whole uh, long ways further up the importance ladder than what we do for a living. Um, you know, the career comes and goes eventually. Uh, that's real life. I think, Robin, it, you know, perspective. You know, that's that's one word I, I use a lot when either I talk to people or uh, I do speaking engagements. You gain a lot of perspective as a young guy. I was 17. And I wasn't sure if I would, you know, make my 21st birthday and to battle that at a young age and you take nothing for granted. I'll I'll tell you, your work ethic goes through the roof because you don't want anything taken away from you. And you're probably more driven than anyone else at your of your peers at that time, because, you know, what real you know, people say, oh, my goodness, do you feel pressure calling a Habs game? I'm like, no, I feel pressure trying to live with a Broviac tube in my chest and, you know taking enough chemotherapy mm-hmm. to kill five horses that, you know, there's pressure. That's fun. My job is exciting. Yeah. There's nerves, but I, I still, I mean, it's the best job in the world. So Robin, the cancer thing, I mean, it's, it's hard and anyone who's been through it. And I mean, look around a room and, and everyone's affected, whether family, friends themselves, and it gives you a perspective um, on how great every day can be. If you make it great, uh, no matter how bad it may be, what it throws at you, And, and that is, I think the message I try to give to people is that, you know, you take the hardships, you try, spin it around and do the, do the best you can. And really quickly, Robin, on that, people asked me last season, what was your best moment of the Habs or what was the best game you called? Or I've done a few of these podcasts, you know, the best moment for me, there's a young kid named Sam Smith. He got to skate with Carey Price. Uh, at a practice, I think it was a make-a-wish with the Habs. He had Hodgkin's lymphoma, the cancer I had. Mm-hmm. And I remember retweeting it and saying, that's awesome, Sam. You're my hero, bud. That's great. And I didn't realize that he came to a game with his family, and his dad's a Leafs fan, and they walked in, and the young guy, Matt, who does the social media, said, hey, Brian, Sam's here. Do you want to meet him? I'm like, yeah. So we brought Sam in and his family. He sat down. We put the headphones on him. I told him that I had his cancer, and we, could, you know, I'm so proud that you beat it. And we just shot the breeze like a couple of buddies for about 10, 15 minutes. And his mom and dad were in tears, you know, when he walked out to thank me. And I'm thinking this is the best moment of my season talking to this kid. And you know, so that will be with me forever. This young guy who had my cancer, and to be able to just you know give him 20 minutes and have some fun with him, I'll, I'll never forget that. Well, you fought the fight firsthand, uh, Muddy, and and that's one thing. But to see that kind of reaction, you remember that for the rest of your life, no? Oh, well, and you know what, Robin, when you're diagnosed and you're young, I don't care even how old you are, you want to meet or you want to talk to someone who's beat it, right? You want to have the, Mm -hmm. you want to have, you want to hope. Who doesn't want that, right? Who doesn't want to cling on to something maybe where there isn't any? 
And any chance I get, like the, the one of the and Bryn, you were there. One of the favorite parts of my tournament, we used to give scholarships to kids yep. that were going to post secondary education. We give well, we started with oh, we give one out, and the demand was so high, we ended up giving five out a year of five thousand for these kids. And every year, it just it didn't not it wasn't even by design. It just happened. The, uh, a, a kid that would come back because I was that was my age. I was battling cancer when going to Nate's getting my uh, broadcasting uh, degree. Right. And they would come back and they'd be our guest speaker the next year. And the stories they would tell, like the one girl I remember, she she had to decide around Christmas time to cut off her leg or not um, to save her life or to give herself the best chance. And she walked up with her prosthetic leg and came up there. And she's a doctor now. Uh, and my mom told me, I think they just she just had a girl. Like, wow. like, so these are the kids and like that I hear and still some of them I still keep in touch with. And geez, there've been around 15 years, I'd say 35, 40 of them that we give scholarships to. And that is what will resonate with me sitting down with their families at the banquet after and just talking, with them, just, just like laughing about chemotherapy and throwing up and whatever, like knowing the battle and hanging out with the families. That's stuff that, I, that sticks with me, that will stick with me for a long time. Well, Brian, it's been a, it's been a while since you've been here in terms of working because, like I say, you're on the nas- national stage now. Just on a personal note, uh, like I say, I've watched from afar whether it's you or a lot of other people who have a platform uh, to do some good. I'm sitting across from Bryn now, who's had a bout with this uh, recently, which is which is frightening. Um, cancer took my mom and my dad. And my wife's mom and her dad. And uh, what you've done and what you're doing and the young stories uh, that you can tell about people now beating it, finding inspiration in what you do, it means a lot to a lot of people out there because it's touched far too many people. And uh, I just say uh, good on you. No matter what games you call, what events you do, uh, Brian, and hopefully there's a lot of big things ahead for you uh, beyond what you've experienced already. That's the number one mark uh, you leave for uh, people like me, and there's a lot of people out there who feel the same, I'm sure. Well, I appreciate that, Robin, and and you're right. I think, what did I read the other day? One in one in two people in the next few years, and um, I'll, I'll never forget when I, the second time, I had a stem cell transplant at the Cross Cancer Institute, and I remember my mom, she loves telling the story, but She's wheeling me out in a wheelchair. I'm like six foot one, you know, 205 is what I usually am. And I think I was 132 pounds wet leaving the hospital. And as she's wheeling me out, I said, you know, mom, I'm going to raise a million dollars for this place someday. And she sort of laughed. She said, how about we just get a meal in you first and put on 10 pounds? (laughs) And, um, and, you know, our family, we're pretty proud. Uh, We raised 1.8 million and we kind of kept going with it. And the sad part, Robin, to your point about losing family, I mean, I lost my brother, 44 years of age, and yeah. it's the year anniversary, just just turned on that. And he was 44, and he leaves a wife and two beautiful boys, my nephews, uh, Tegan and Jesse, who are 12 and 8, and they love hockey. And I'm so excited I get to take them to the um, Oilers-Habs game in December um, before Christmas. So uh, I get to be Uncle Brian for a day, which will be awesome. So, yeah, man, I get it, and I'm more than happy to and continue to do it for as long as I can. It doesn't take a lot to leave an impact, and I don't mean just me, anybody. It doesn't mm-hmm. take a lot to have an impact on, on somebody. So, Whew, Okay. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about what you wow, do. Brad, come on, lighten it up for crying uh, out loud. I, uh, just- I, I'm going to try that. Uh, I'm going to say this, and I, I want a gut reaction from you. Television voice of the Montreal Canadiens. How do you feel about that? How did you can get that? How'd you get what that a gig? gig? Huh? <laughs> can I swear? You can do it's a, a podcast. You can say whatever you want. Brent, it's fucking awesome. It is <laughs> the best job in the world. Hey, listen, as my former boss, you should tell me I should never swear around a microphone or a phone, but I just did it. No, well, care. this is podcasting. It's a whole whole new world. And by the way, you survived working with both myself and Ryan Rashog at CTV Edmonton. So you've, you've done pretty well. So is Shogger. And I'm on, I'm winding it down a little bit here, but uh, you've learned so much over your career, but you move in. That is a, that's not only is that a sweet gig, that is a pressure gig because that is really, they're the still, they're the second most winning franchise in sports in North America, if I'm not mistaken. Bryn, I'll tell you when I got the job, 
and for it was it was shocking how fast it happened too. It was and I I've been doing hockey when with the Pyeongchang Olympics hit and uh, Gord Miller uh, had to go over. He went for NBC and Chris Cuthbert went for uh, the Ark conglomerate. And so there was about 14 senator games that had to be done. Um, so I was already doing like U18s and World Hockey Championships and calling like Telus Cup and a bunch of uh, those type of Hockey Canada events. So that was sort of my, I guess everything's an audition, right? I guess it was an audition. That was my chance to take those games by the horn and, and do it. And so that was sort of my opportunity. And, and this last summer, when John Bartlett went back to Sportsnet to do the Leafs regionals, that job came open and I was obviously interested in, and, uh, uh, yeah. So another Edmonton guy, Paul Graham, my boss of live events for TSN. Mm-hmm. He, uh, yeah, he called me to his office and he says, all right, kid, go do it. Don't screw it up. <laughs> so, go do it. Good luck. That, get out of my office. Go figure it out. That, and it was like, whoa. And it was, um, you know what? You just took off. And that was that conversation, <laughs> I think, was September 1st. And the preseason started in a week and a half. So it was awesome. It was I hit the ground running and there was nerves and obviously an excitement. And the sad part was it was my my brother was was ill and we he was really fighting and and the tough, not to get, but it, it's a big part of the story. Like I remember, I went home and to tell him, like I got, I was flying home the next day anyways to visit him and family. Right. And I got to tell him in person that I got the job, and it was the first time I'd seen him smile in a long time. And he was really weak. He got out of his chair and he came over and he gave me this big hug. And it was like, oh, like it was really cool that to share that. My only regret is he wasn't healthy enough to come to the Bell Center and to see a game with me. But, um, I know he's watching. And, uh, and when I, when the Oilers, uh, hosted the Habs and they headed their West coast swing last year, it was right around the time he was really ill. And I got to see him in the hospital and I don't even know how to say this. Like I, I got to say, I got to say goodbye to him when he was still with us. Cause I just knew, and, and who wants to sit around and watch your loved one. Yeah. Suffer? And, uh, but I had to say goodbye to him, Brandon, go to the game and call the game that night. Wow. That's, and, uh, that's tough. And, and listen, I'm not looking for, I'm not, I'm not looking for any sympathy. I'm not looking for, but the, as you guys know, the, the Twitter world and people, you don't know what somebody's going through on a particular game. No. And yeah, so, so a broadcaster screws up, miss IDs and name. Secondly, some of these buildings are calling it on Mars. Like it's, you're so high up there. Yeah. But like, there's days that are tough. And that last year was a real tough season. Um, this year, I know he's in a better place and he's not suffering. And, and I got a year under my belt. Um, so it's been a lot. Um, is fun the right word? Sure. It's been a lot more fun. Uh, I'm really loving it. And I feel, uh, to wrap up the question, God, I'm blabbing. Uh, to wrap up the question, though, when I walk guys into the Bell Center and I go up in the rafters and you look at the retired uh, numbers, the 24 cups and all the history. And every time there's a season opener and I've only done two, but the home opener season opener and you, and, and, and how the Habs do it right. Like they just had their 110th anniversary and they had all the captains and assistants out and they honored the, the players. They do it right. And it is, I pinched myself doing that walk and I don't think it'll ever get old because I know how lucky I am. I've earned it, but I know it's a special job and I don't take it for granted. Every single game, I call it like a game seven because it's my game seven. Well, I tell you, you you won the lottery, and and there's a lot of people who put in the work. But to get that job, I mean, to me, somebody my age, the Montreal Canadiens are, well, they're a storied franchise. It goes without saying. And to make that, I mean, you had lots of experience, and you did work your way up the ladder. But, man, to have your number come up in that at at Bell Centre with that franchise, I've been in that room in that rink many times during my days on the Euler beat and it was special every time you say you pinch yourself I gotta ask how does a guy who once did weather in Lloyd Minster uh, end up end up you got pictures of somebody don't you Mudra <laughs> Uh, well, my catch uh, on oh, bread, bread was the king of the cheese, but I, I, I tell you, no, no flurries, no worries back to you in the studio. And then the gunpoint, that was the hot line and Lloyd, the, oh God, Lloyd. Yeah, I was the, uh, I was the, Robin, I was the weather specialist. And by the way, weather specialist means you know nothing. Um, it's like, you know, you got to look for the thing, meteorologists, and then you can trust yeah. them and they're wrong anyways but i mean weather specialist my god whatever i'm special all right and then and i was also the agriculture reporter in lloyd so if you did one you had to also do the ag reports of course my my dad 
went to Ryerson in Toronto to be a meteorologist. And he dropped out, he said, because I don't know, some of the math is too hard. And then what? He became a math teacher. So imagine that. <laughs> and my dad was a farmer. Um, so I had my dad's dream job at 19. The cow reports and the weather. Wow. Just living the dream. So Robin, yeah, it came full circle. My old man, I still, I talked to him actually today. We still joke about that. But he should have just stuck it out with the Ukrainian rock band and kept that going. <laughs> isn't, Anyways, he's retired now. He's living a good life. So it's all good. Isn't weather the easiest gig on the planet? I mean, if you're right 50% of the time, you're all yes, good, right? Good. Oh, you could be wrong 80% of the time. You go home to your wife and family, you pet the dog, you go back, you get to do it again and get paid. Unbelievable. I'm watching. Ian Leonard had it figured out, eh? Yeah, oh, had it figured out in Edmonton and what, what, a, what a schmo. What's he doing now? Oh, that's right. He's doing it. He's doing the weather uh, successfully, very successfully, I might add, in Minneapolis and St. Paul. He's done a great job. Okay, so I've been watching a fair amount of Habs games this year. And yeah. uh, with on the center ice package, and like I said, you're doing a great job this year. But the one thing that has absolutely blown me away is I have got no idea which team is going to show up from one night to the next. It just seems like they are uh, they're just they're very mercurial. They're all over the place this year. Uh, am I getting a good read, or what do you think, Brent? I look at it two ways. So if you look at last year, bait minus Sherratt, right? Kincaid, which hasn't worked out. He's down in Laval for conditioning. They called up Caden Primo, Keith's kid, who had his uh, debut the other night against the Avalanche. Hey, by the way, welcome to the NHL. You're going to take on Nate McKinnon. Gabe Landeskog returns and take on the Avalanche. But anyways, <laughs> he did all right. He looked nervous, but he did all right. They're the same team, Britt. It's not like they've acquired Artemi Panarin or like, like you know, signed a bunch of defensemen to bolster their defense. Yeah. Um, they're right where I think that I would expect them to be. Battling for a wild card, same as last year. Carey Price has struggled um, by his standards for sure. Yep. Last year, his December was strong. Um, in his last game, um, uh, he looked really good. Um, so, I mean, they're, they're a team, five on five. They're one of the best five on five scoring teams. That Gallagher, Tatar, Dino line, they will outwork anybody. They are feisty. They don't, they rarely take a night off, if ever, or shift off. Um, but they admit it. If they don't all work, Brent, if they don't buy in and they don't all work and buy into Claude Julien's system, they can't win because they don't. Ha they can't have an off night where, let's say, Ovechkin's off, but then all of a sudden Kuznetsov goes off. Or, you know, in your town, right, um, 97 can have a slow night by his standards and then Dreisaitl pops in three. Yeah. Like, they don't have that player. They just don't. And so they have to buy into their system. They have to outwork you. They're fast and they can. And they're also relying really this season on three defensemen. Like Ben Sherrod has been averaging close to 30 minutes a game his last few games. That's ridiculous. In Winnipeg, you never saw that. And they got Petrie, who I think plays better when he gets less ice time, not more. And then Shea Weber has seemed to turn back, back the clock and having a great year. So it, they're exactly where I expected them to be. Um, so there's really no surprises to me if they come out and they work hard and they're tenacious and they forecheck and they use their speed, they got a good chance to win. They're tough to play against. If they don't, the defensive breakdown seem to happen. Uh, their penalty kill has been, it's been tough to watch this year. They've really struggled. So, um, you know, they're a couple pieces away, but they also have young guys coming up. So for Mark Bergevin, it's tough. You're juggling that. Yeah, we got to make the playoffs now. But we've got these pieces coming up the pipeline. So they're, they're where I expected them to be, to answer the question. Brian, even though, uh, you know, times have changed and the Habs aren't winning Stanley Cups like they they once did, I don't recall ever being in a city, an NHL city at least, where expectations were consistently uh, as high uh, you mentioned Claude Julien. The bottom line in Montreal, as it should be everywhere, but let's face it, it's not, is uh, Stanley Cup or bust. That's not always realistic, but that doesn't matter to the fans who fill that building all the time. Is it palpable? Uh, is Can you feel it when you go to a market like Montreal as opposed to Toronto, as opposed to an, an Edmonton? That's got five Stanley Cups, let's not forget that, but... There, everybody I talk to who works in Montreal says there's just something different about it. And they're right, and there is. And it's just, I don't know if it's the rich tradition, the 24 Cups, 
Um, they've been around forever. I mean, like I just said, 110 years, 1909. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it is, it's one of those things. And also, I mean, and it's a Canadian franchise, right? Like, I mean, you look across here, the last team to win one, it, the drought is on. It has been for a long time. And I think yep. anyone in Canada would be happy with anyone winning a cup at this point. Um, I remember you guys growing up in Northern Alberta during the heyday. I remember specifically saying to my parents, Hey, guys, like I thought it was like the WWF. Like, why don't why doesn't the NHL let another team win? Why do the Oilers always get to win every time? Like, I was like, little did I know, as a kid growing up in Northern Alberta, like what a team! Like, you just don't. It was insane. And you know, the Habs had that obviously decades before, and with their incredible runs that they went on. But Robin, it is a special city. Max Domi should work for you know Tourism Montreal, uh, hmm. La Belle Province, because he is one of those young guys who loves the spotlight. He says, "Listen, anyone who'll listen to me, come play in Montreal. It is a fantastic market." And I'm always curious. And I mean, I'm no insider. I leave that to people smarter than I am. But like Jake Gardner is a guy they knock the tires on, and a Matt Duchesne, and everyone's different. And I get it. But like. Some player, I'm not saying those specific players, but the Habs knock their, you know, their tires on a lot of players, and some just don't want to go. And I don't know if it's, I don't know what it is. You don't ask the players or or the agents, but it's interesting to me. Like I hear that a lot. You know, the player maybe just didn't want to sign in Montreal, and I, I, I don't get it. I mean, it's wow, what a place to play hockey. If you're winning in that town, my lord, like what a feeling. And if you're losing in that town, well, it matters. You know, it matters. And not so, not only you're losing, but you're losing in two official languages. <laughs> oh yeah right yeah they asked me how how you know people ask oh so you do the games in french and i go and they say do you speak french and i go ah piquito <laughs> and they kind of look at me twice i'm like yeah whatever you get it brent but I, yeah, yeah it's 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 uh like i've always believed that the pressure is times two in montreal where it's like nowhere else well, the media, it's, 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 it's different. It, and, and, and Robin said, I don't know the word to use different. It's just uh, different, special, unique. It is just one of a kind. It's a one. I mean, I got to cover, you know, the Leafs when I was a you know young reporter in sports center, I was in Edmonton covering the Oilers during some tough years. Um, Munch, yeah, Montreal is just, it's its own thing and that's okay. It's cool. It's uh it's a neat place uh, to have an office. That's for sure. Now, you know, you wander in and out of the media pack there as opposed to the guys that are at the rink absolutely every day. Um, how about that crew out there? Is, is, is cranky old Pat Hickey still uh, shuffling around out there? The oh, rink, yeah, or? Pat, Pat. I sit with Pat. Uh, we have a lot of media meals. Pat will join us. We've had some good chats. Yeah, he's, uh, he's another one of a kind. It's a pretty <laughs> tough crowd, though, isn't it? Oh, yeah. What? One more time, Robin. Sorry. It's a pretty tough crowd. These guys uh, aren't scared to ask questions when things aren't going well. No, no. And you know what? And but like Chloe Julian's no dummy either, right? I mean, he gets it. Of course, like they expect the, the those guys will respect you more if you ask the hard question. I mean, they know it's coming. They're not. They mm-hmm. they know exactly what's up. You know what? Your power your power play struggling, or the penalty kill is, or you haven't scored, or this or this player, or yeah, they, they expect it. I mean, I think if you're a coach or a player, um, I guess everyone's different, but would wouldn't you rather be somewhere where it mattered and they care? Or go to the skate, you know, in, in certain places. I won't mention names or cities, but you show up in your flip flops and you finish your skate, there's yeah. one reporter and you're gone. Florida? Like and the accountability's <laughs> not the same. Yeah. Uh, no. Sorry, Robin. I didn't say it. I didn't say a word. Um, he he did. He said Florida. <laughs> you didn't say Florida. Uh, you you Anyways. you talked about growing up in Boyle, and you said the hockey arena is right next to the curling arena, which is leading me to the next thing too. That you've done curling coverage and uh, solid curling coverage on TSN through the years, and you get to work with a guy named Vic Router, who's been there forever. Yeah, Vic is, uh, there's just certain people like, you know, you get to know or work in the industry. So like our, our buddy and a good friend of mine, so Daryl McIntyre recently hung him up and, yep. and Daryl, Daryl's just, he's in his own league. Right. And Ken Shaw, if you, I don't know if like out West, you may not know, but Ken Shaw is Daryl McIntyre, right? Like he was the CTV voice in Toronto for yes. a million years and he's going to step down. And, um, Vic Roder, you know, I look at guys, you know, like Rod Smith, there's just the guys that have just done it forever. Gino Retta that are just, you know, they're iconic, right? Like, I grew up watching curling. 
you know, I remember being sick in the Cross Cancer Institute in 1999, and I tuned in three draws a day. Jeff Stoughton won it that year. Gerald Shimko was the guy who was in the Final Four, the gentle giant from Saskatchewan. And I will never forget that Briar and Vic was with me every draw, and Linda, and God bless the Moosey, who we've lost. But, like, that, like, you know, curling, he, he's a part of all of us if you love curling. And so Vic is Vic's actually way funnier than you think too. Like he's he's <laughs> he'll pull a he'll pull a couple one liners out every now and then. He's he's pretty funny. Um, so it's I mean I love it. The curling family, as I call it, and CSN is just a great crew. We have a blast. Um, I hope Vic does it till he's 140. Um, I joke with Vic too. I don't know if he thought it was funny or not, but I said, Vic, you got a great strategy for some advertising. So picture this, you guys imagine like a beautiful room with flowers. There's a casket, (laughs) nice music. And Vic walks in and goes, hello, Canada. When you're ready to make the final destination (laughs) and he taps up the casket, you know, call us for uh, whatever funeral homes, right? Make the final. I get it. Hey, hey. He, got, he got a smirk. I don't know if he thought it was. I think it's brilliant. But it's I mean, big I line. Think all my jokes are funny. I think all my jokes are pretty good, Brent. <laughs> now, 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 Brian, I should know this. When did TSN start? 80. Oh, God. Gonna, I think it was 85, wasn't it? See, I remember you're talking about Vic. I was a young uh, sports writer at the Kamloops Daily News, and okay. they told me I had to go off to the local affiliate to talk about this, uh, the sports network or TSN. And I'm thinking, what the hell is this? And the guy I had to go see in, in year one, he was doing the rounds as Vic router. Yeah. And he was sort of like the spokesman giving what's this 24 hour. I mean, this was new in 85. I mean, you didn't have it everywhere. Now it's shoulder shrug. Yeah. It's all sports all the time. That's what we do. Um, that he's still kicking around, working, uh, you know, uh, working at curling. It tells you how much time goes by. I mean, that's 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 what thirty five years now. Holy crap! Well, he and here, here's one that you, you think you're Robin. I'm with you, man. Like you, really, I I think back when I was in high school. Do you know that there wasn't the internet? <laughs> yeah. Like, like and now like there's streaming sports and like. Like everyone, every team has their own mm-hmm. channel, like in all the social media, they do an incredible job. Like I tell Matt with the abs all the time, like they're amazing. Like the work they do with their iPhones and there's mm-hmm. things now I will, I have, I travel and I don't know how much you guys follow the social media or whatever, but like, let's say, let's say me and Dave Poulin are in New York. We're at MSG. I now have the capacity of my iPhone to plug in my microphone with a TSN mic flash, shoot it, upload it to the Gero, And within three minutes, the guys back there will upload it. All of a sudden, boom, they font us, link, it's in, preview. And yeah. they can run it on Sports Center if they wanted to. It's The quality is that good. It's amazing, it's is it not? I know. It's insane. Like, you know, I remember, like, using, like, the phone where you have to go, da six, da eight, right? Like, and people use typewriters. Flip phone. Yeah, like, when the commercial McDavid did on the typewriter, I'm like, no chance he knew what that was. Like, <laughs> I, you know what? It's funny, it, and it's right now. I was gonna say when I was in J school, it was it was uh, typewriters and carbon paper. I'm a false. I'm a fossil, and now it's instantaneous. Can you imagine? Uh, had those great Euler teams of the '80s? Uh, what it would be like social media wise if everybody had a camera and a microphone in their telephone? Oh. Well, but that's the thing now, like, like Crosby, right? Not, you know, a guy that he's got not a sniff of the social media and it's, you know what guys, it, it, and, and on a, it's a serious, on a serious note, I mean, it's about, uh, holding people accountable, uh, the right decisions. You look at the NHL right now and, and just the news that has made headlines this season. And mm-hmm. it's, it's about being accountable and, and, and nowadays, like, it's just, you gotta be very careful about you know, using an F bomb on a podcast. I mean, it's just, you know, I mean, I'm joking, but you never know anymore. Right. It's, it's such a different world that we live in. We got to let you go. And, uh, it, this has been a blast. It's uh, great to finally catch up to you. Cause we've had a bunch of guys on and we've been talking now for weeks about, we got to get Brian on and it's, uh, it's great. And, uh, thanks for your time today. 
Britt, I appreciate it. And I, before I leave you guys, two things. Um, you know, Robin, I loved reading you for years, and you just did a hell of a job, and you're Thank always you. one of my favorites, and I'm not even sucking up. And Bryn, God love you. What people don't know about you, I was a weather um, specialist, BSer, and <laughs> agriculture reporter, and you were with the Oilers at that time, and you knew how badly I wanted to get into sports. Yep. And not a lot of people would give you the time of day back then, and you had to just – I didn't have an uncle or uh, someone up, up high in the business – to help me and you know Bryn you always got me media passes I got to go in the room and and later got to work with you at CTV Edmonton and got that job I still got to talk to Tim Stella see why the hell he didn't hire me for that weekend job but that's okay it worked out better you ever talk to Tim you ask him for me what well, the hell we're going to talk to him next week so you Perfect. just you, you <laughs> just hang, hang in there will you anyway, so, so, so gentlemen uh, thanks thanks for having me and it's fun and it's always great to catch up with my with my Edmonton people it's hey, awesome th- Thanks for coming on, pal. And uh, yeah. not only great work on the air, but all that stuff you do off the air uh, certainly has uh, been duly noted as it should be. Boys, no flurries, no worries. Have a good one. Gotcha. Pro-Am Sports is Edmonton's home for sports and entertainment memorabilia. Featuring unique collectibles and apparel, we've got you and your fan cave covered. Pro-Am Sports, located in Edmonton at 12728 St. Albert Trail and proamsports.ca. It's a very sizable book. If it's on your coffee table, you better have a strong coffee table. It is called World Capital of Curling, written by Terry Jones. One of the many things written by Terry Jones, who joins us in studio. How are you doing today? Not bad, Brad. It's great to uh, great to have somebody actually in here. I think you're our first guest in studio, is he not? Robin? Yes, he is. He is first, uh, as he often is. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, this book, let's talk about this right off the top. How many pages is this? It's uh, this is a great book. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. I'm going to take a look. It's over. It's 357 pages long. 357 big pages. Big big pages. Okay, so uh, how'd you get the idea to write this? Somebody come to you? I didn't. Uh, it was uh, uh, a situation with the there's the Northern Alberta Curling Association is a now defunct. Uh, uh, outfit they they had their 100th anniversary their centennial and then they were amalgamated into the alberta or curling alberta i guess it's called and darwin daviduk and terry morris of the northern alberta championship curling society which is a totally separate thing to the naca uh came to me and they wanted to do this centennial project and i wasn't really all blathered up about this idea of theirs but they worked on me, and uh, and I'd done the Eskimo book uh, that uh, uh, Epic Les- Legacy uh, Edmonton Eskimos uh, that uh, was, I believe, well, I know it was $245 a book and weighed 10 pounds and had a, <laughs> a, a box, <laughs> presentation box with uh, replicated uh, the 14 Grey Cup uh, championship rings and everything, and it's loosely... Uh, modeled on that without the box and the rings and all that stuff. But uh, anyhow, the whole concept was something I'd never heard of before, which was we're not trying to, we're not even going to contemplate uh, selling the thing. The whole idea was we're going to print up, uh, I think it was 1,260 copies or whatever it is, with the idea of giving it uh, as a gift to uh, the curlers that are, uh, you know, featured in there to the, uh, I think it's 98 rinks, uh, arenas, curling clubs, whatever you want to call them. Uh, and each club would get one book per sheet of ice with the idea that they could uh, raffle it off or, uh, you know, whatever they wanted to do sure. with it uh, to raise money for their, for their curling club. Uh, but uh, I finally managed to talk them into just on the concept that, I mean, the Briar here in 2005, if you remember, drew 281,000 people. Uh, uh, that's a record. The World uh, Curling Champions, Curling Championships, uh, two years later, drew a record that still stands. Uh, the, the Olympic trials, two years after that, drew a record that still stands. And there are a lot of volunteers and a lot of fans that uh, went to curling events. So I, I said, you got to have a component in there where 
these people can get it, their hands on a book. Because yeah. They were a big part of, of, of the success story. So they, they, they agreed to, but they said, we're not doing it. <laughs> so uh, here you go. Anyhow, uh, through the printer, uh, Ron Watamanuk, who you may remember as an old baseball player in Edmonton, Robin, uh, Edmonton Tigers, I think it was. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he's, uh, the, he runs Donnelly Printing. And uh, he worked out the math so that they could add another 240 books without really changing the, the numbers other than the cost of paper and stuff like that. So that's what they printed up and uh, worked out an, a, an agreement with uh, Curling Alberta uh, to put 240 books on sale there. At a hundred dollars, which seems like ridiculous, <laughs> but you know, if, if you look at that book, it costs probably close to double that to print it. I know at those numbers, very impressive. You know what, Bryn? It's funny when we talked about uh, having Jonesy come on. He said, "Well, I got to get you a copy of the book. I'll head out of town by the time I get back. You'll have a chance to look at it." My my doorbell rings. I answer the door. It's Darwin Davidek. I'm thinking. <laughs> That's pretty good service when you get a guy as long-standing that's as that. That's not Perlator. That's not UPS. No. Let me tell you about this guy because uh, he's been, like, this is a volunteer all, mm-hmm. all his career, right? I mean, his claim to fame as a curler, curling skip, uh, whose third was Wes Montgomery, uh, was they gave up an eight-ender in a, in a, in a um, what do you call it, a playdowns game against Texture Bay, and they were leading when it happened. Wow. wow. <laughs> Anyhow, he was... <laughs> When I signed on to this project, I was going to do it like every other project, you know, writing's a lonely sort of world sometimes, right? But uh, this guy was all in. We went to the to the archive, the two archives, I would guess about 18 times. He was there with a, me for about 14 of those. Wow. Uh, hmm. And and uh, and most of the, uh, the work on the pictures and stuff like that... Um, and, and Robin, if you want to describe your friend... Uh, Laurel, uh, the the caricaturist, I think that's what really sets the book apart more than anything else. Darwin uh, and and other people uh, really worked hard to try to find pictures that had mm-hmm, never yeah. been published before, and and uh, a lot of those came from families and stuff like that. And we also had a photographer or photographers uh, shoot the memorabilia of the I think it's twenty seven of the one hundred people we feature in there, and. Uh, and there's about, I don't know, 500 pictures of pins yep. of Curly Waltz, uh, who's got the world's greatest pin collection out of Calgary, a curling pin collection. Anyhow, um, because of that, that football book I wrote, I, I was, uh, the one thing I didn't like about it is is that you're, you're, you're featuring all these people uh, from different eras, and uh, some of them played in the black and white yep. years. Yeah. Anyhow, so I got this idea I should... Uh, why don't we get a caricaturist? And and this is the point that this book became, I think, significant. And I don't think there's ever been a book published like that by a curling by a sports association. Is because they had enough budget and and will and desire that I mean, Laurel doesn't work cheap. <laughs> no, she doesn't. Great, she does great work. Oh, it's amazing. I, I'm just anyhow. I I, I'm, I decided. They said, yeah, do it. Don't worry about it. We'll, we'll, we'll work out the dollars. And uh, so I start surfing the internet and uh, of, of caricatures. Edmonton, I think that's the two words I pounded in. And uh, up comes a, a picture of, uh, or a drawing of hers of Brian Hall, of all people. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, and I went from there. And uh, uh, to me, they're just awesome. You know what? I, I read that book, and the artwork is so terrific. I love old photos. I love the facts. But you're right, and it's funny, Jonesy, and you know this. It's a small world. Uh, I had a when I got out of the media business full time, uh, I bought an auto glass shop in the West End, up by Westgate Chevrolet. Free plug. Um, <laughs> his name is Phil Hawkswell. He still runs it today. His wife is Laurel Hawkswell, and he'd come in. Uh, or she'd come into the shop and she would do his advertising for him. So when he did social media to promote the business, and I thought she's bloody good. So Laurel did a family one of, of us at home. And I've seen her work around town. And when I heard about Jonesy's book, um, he obviously found her 
on his own. But I thought, that's perfect, and he's going to be thrilled. I have not seen anybody, for my money, that's a better caricaturist. And it's funny, you know who else is, uh, here I am going sideways, you know the band Trooper, Ray McGuire, the lead singer, his mom was a caricaturist. Really? And she did a caricature mm. of me when I was like 17 years old at Brentwood Mall in Burnaby. I always loved caricatures. You'd go to the PNE or out here, Klondike Days, I'm sure. There was always somebody sitting there doing one. So when I saw Laurel's work, being a fan of this, I thought, she's fantastic. And when Jonesy mentioned that he had her doing the uh, illustrations in this book, I thought perfect, and it's exactly how I thought it would well, be. Well, I should go sideways here and, and, and point out that when I entered this uh, studio that uh, her work is on the door. Thank of, you very uh, much. Yes. I was just going to point out we the used outsiders. her, and she has done a marvelous job. While people are listening to this podcast, you're probably staring at the character work that she's done, so it's yep. unbelievable. Hey, one other thing about the book that uh, that was strong for me. There's a lot of ego in curling. Now, I love all of these curlers, but, man, some of the guy, the, the intense competition and rivalries between some of these guys, I didn't realize how deep it was until I started to get more into it in the, in the 90s and the 2000s. But you brought everybody together beautifully in this book, I think. Thank you. Well, it was fun. It, was a, it turned into a total labor of love, and to some extent I didn't realize uh, – the amount of love I had for the, I mean, uh, curling is, is, uh, is difficult to cover in a lot of ways because, uh, you get punted to the back of the sports sections on occasion and, uh, it's hockey, 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 hockey in this town. And I'm not saying it shouldn't be because I'm hockey, hockey, hockey with 90% of the time when, uh, the pucks are flying around. But, uh, You've also, you're, when you're doing a, an event like the one I just came off of in uh, Leduc, which is only five days long, you're sitting in the bowels of an arena for 12, 14, 16 hours. And uh, it's, you know, you, you do a hockey game, you show up an hour before the game, you cover the game and uh, take another hour to pound your copy and uh, you're out of there. That's your day, right? Uh, curling is much more involved, but the, the, the thing, well, when I, when I, it was, it was a neat weekend for me because they put me into the uh, Canadian Curling Hall of Fame and and uh, they asked me some questions uh, during the presentation and one of them was, uh, you know, about, you know, your reaction to this. And, and I said, the thing that I love most about curling is that unlike all the other sports is after the game is over, you go to the Briar Patch, and the fans are having a beer with the athletes. Yep. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't happen anywhere else no. that I know of. And, and they're great guys, most of them. Uh, they don't always like each other, but uh, and but in terms of being accessible and quotable, I mean, today's athlete has been schooled on how to, has gone to what I'd call quote school, except it's non-quote school, where... Uh, uh, say something, but say nothing. Yes, and and uh, use as many cliches as you can possibly come up with, and uh, to make it almost, you know, it, it's it's difficult to to read a to write a hockey piece with the same kind of pop as the uh, as the uh, quotes that go with a curling piece. Ho hum, another Hall of Fame entrance. I know. For, I was just going to joke that. that pretty out. smooth. I thought you did. I thought you now, did that nicely. Now we beat us to it. We've got uh, hockey, we've got uh, curling, we've got CFL, we've got Alberta. Uh, how many am I missing here, Jonesy, for uh, all Edmonton. the fame? Oh, Edmonton, yep. yes, and, local. Uh, and I think the most, uh, everybody else seems to view the Hockey Hall of Fame as the one, but uh, uh, the Canadian sports media one uh, is one for me. And the reason, it's, it's funny when you go into your first Hall of Fame or second Hall of Fame or whatever, it's like... Uh, uh, you don't look at it the same as when you when you get down the road a little bit and get a couple more of them because uh, <laughs> you know you know what it is is the thing that impresses you is not uh, you know uh, everything that uh, you would think it's you take a look at the list of the other people who are in it mm -hmm. and when people say well you've been in the hockey hall of fame and all that uh, the curling hall of fame camp. It, that big a deal for you in the curling hall of fame you go into the hall of fame 
Okay, you're not over in the the, the writers' wing or the or the you know mm-hmm. in the case of the Canadian Football Hall of Fame, uh, which is in the stadium in 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 Hamilton. Uh, the actual uh, media hall of fame is in the press box. I mean, they they run the tour up there, but because uh, it's a nice view of the field and everything. But uh, and in terms of the curling hall of fame, I mean, it, uh, there's only like eight people from the media over the years that are in the thing. Jack Matheson of the mm-hmm. the Winnipeg Tribune, who is a virtual idol of mine, Jimmy's dad. Yep. Uh, Don Buckets Fleming, uh, another classic guy who, who I worked with, and. Uh, and and guys like uh, Ovik Router of uh, TSN and uh, uh, Don Whitman and uh, Don Chevrier and a few guys like that, uh, Larry Wood, who's covered fifty three briars, I think it is. Uh, How did he survive that? Oh, I don't know. Well, I survived a lot of them <laughs> with him, but uh, and I think I've only done twenty seven or twenty eight. But uh, that's what that was. The, what really tickled me about that, and uh, to have it happen kind of in conjunction with the book was uh, turned out to be a Pretty cool deal. Pro-Am Sports is Edmonton's home for sports and entertainment memorabilia. Featuring unique collectibles and apparel, we've got you and your fan cave covered. Pro-Am Sports, located in Edmonton at 12728 St. Albert Trail and proamsports.ca. So there you go, Brian Mudrick along with Terry Jones on this episode of The Outsiders. Bryn Griffiths and Robin Brownlee with you as always. Okay, uh, let's tell everybody what's coming up next week. Looking forward to this one, the Battle of Alberta. keep hearing everybody talk about how great the Battle of Alberta is when the two, the two hockey teams get together. And I'm thinking, you know what? It Okay, sure, but it ain't the 80s. That's that's. You need to have these two teams find a way to get to each other in the playoffs if you want to truly experience the chaos and the tension and the sleepless nights of a Battle of Alberta. Well, nobody under 40 actually saw it, aside from YouTube clips, uh, because it's been so long since these teams met uh, with the money on the table in a playoff series. Yeah, so... Coming up next week, we're going to be chatting with Tim Spellacy, who is the longtime Oilers host on ITV. I'm going to talk with Grant Pollock, who is the longtime host on 2 and 7 in Calgary, about their, their memories of the Battle of Alberta when it really was truly a Battle of Alberta. And I'm not saying that we haven't had some Battles of Alberta on the football turf, but most people, when they think of the Battle of Alberta, probably think more about hockey than they do about football. Just, just my opinion. So we're looking forward to talking with Tim and Grant next week. And also coming up in the new year, after we have a two-week episode of It's Our Best Of show coming up. But once we get into the new year, we're going to take you behind the dressing room door. It's an episode with Barry Stafford and Ken Lowe. Staffy has been a longtime uh, equipment manager with the Edmonton Oilers, and he and Barry is well decorated. He's won pretty much everything. I don't think there's much left that he hasn't won. Kenny Lowe came over from the Edmonton Eskimos where he'd won a Grey Cup or two, and he came over to the Edmonton Oilers and won a Stanley Cup and a few other hockey baubles along the way. So that's coming up in January. Uh, Robin, the other thing, too, we, we've been getting a lot of positive feedback from people, and it's great. And People are more than welcome to email us at mightymouth at shaw.ca and uh, tell us what you like, what you don't like. It's funny. It, nobody seems to want to tell us what they don't like. Well, that's okay. Maybe they don't like me or they don't like you. I don't think anybody's going to download this show because they don't like us. But whatever, a, a little feedback would be great. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Good, yeah. good good, good, or bad. Yeah. But you're right. People aren't going to download and, and then complain. That's more internet stuff, eh? Like, hey, you suck, Brownlee. You suck. And I get that occasionally, but uh, <laughs> not over the sh- not over the pod anyway. No, absolutely not. Uh, make sure you tell your friends and subscribe, and uh, check out our RSS feed. And uh, you can pick us up on your favorite ear candy sites, pretty much everywhere. And uh, we look forward to uh, the next few shows as we kind of slowly wrap up. 2000 and tw- uh, two thousand I was going to say two thousand and twenty two thousand and nineteen. <laughs> Let's not push it. Let's not push it at all. Robin, thanks for your time today. Yeah, I'll see you next time. Okay, will do. Proceeding with.
was recorded earlier because we were ashamed to do it now.